Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Lab Talk. Today is Thursday, October 5th, and I'm actually hosting live from our immersive lab in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And our topic for today is all about best practices to help reduce culture contamination. My name is Megan McDowell, and I'm excited to welcome back our speaker for today, Mary Kay Bates. If you previously joined us for her lab talk on CO2 incubator care and maintenance, then you know you're in for an excellent presentation. Mary Kay Bates is a senior global cell culture scientist with Thermo Fisher Scientific, where she provides cell culture expertise to colleagues and customers. Her knowledge is based on 20 years of experience in academic and industrial cell and molecular biology labs, focusing on cancer and gene therapy and authoring several publications. Mary Kay holds a Master of Science in Microbiology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Great, thanks, Megan. It's great to be back at Lab Talk. Um, thanks everybody for joining. I'm excited about this topic today and hopefully you're excited as well. The first thing I wanna say before we really get started is that everybody who works with cultured cells experiences contamination. And we'll talk about why that is. Um, so let's just go ahead and get started and we'll go, we'll start right off with my favorites, bacteria and fungi. Um, bacteria and fungi are the most common type of cell culture contaminants because they're everywhere. They're on our skin, they're in the air around us, they're in the environment, um, and they grow so fast. So on average, mammalian cells double roughly once per day but in comparison, E. coli double once every 20 minutes. So you can see how they can quickly colonize in your culture and go crazy growing really fast. When you get a cell culture contamination with bacteria and yeast, here's a good picture. Um, they cause your growth medium to become cloudy or turbid. So you know really pretty much as soon as you pick up that culture dish that you've got a contamination, it's bad news. If you have a contamination with molds, uh, you can see them kind of floating around. They look like flirt, furry clumps. I kind of think they look like little tumbleweeds floating around in your dish. Um, the, the problem with bacteria and fungi in your cell culture is because they grow so fast and because many of them put out lactic acid as a byproduct of their metabolism, they make your culture really acidic. It overwhelms the buffer in your growth medium very quickly. And of course, they take up all of the nutrients, leaving nothing left over for your cultured cells. So the next type of contamination I want to talk about are mycoplasmas. Dun, dun, dun. These are the most serious and widespread contaminants in our cultures because they're not detected very well. It's very common that people are not aware that they have a mycoplasma contamination and also because of their negative effects on our cultured cells. Mycoplasmas come from us. Um, they come from other cultures. There are more than 100 different species of mycoplasmas. Many of them are human normal flora and some are normal, or, well, not normal, some are human pathogens. Um, it's very common to get a mycoplasma contamination from another culture, uh, cross-contaminating it from a contaminated culture, or you receive a culture from a collaborator. So we'll talk about ways to prevent the spread of mycoplasmas in your culture in just a few minutes. Technically, mycoplasmas are bacteria, but they are much smaller than most bacteria. Many of you are aware that mycoplasmas can be as small as 0.2 micrometers. In comparison, E. coli are about one micron in size. So because they're so small, they can grow really, really dense in your culture without you being aware at all. And also because of their small size, they can possibly sometimes slip through fi uh, filter sterilizers that we use to sterilize growth media and reagents for cell culture. Now, although they are technically bacteria, mycoplasmas do not have a cell wall, unlike most bacteria. This makes them resistant to most antibiotics that we use in cell culture. So when you're using penicillin and streptomycin in your cell culture on a regular basis, that does not help you at all against mycoplasmas. Um, so let's talk about their effects on your cells. Mycoplasmas have very negative effects on your cells. They can affect your host cell's metabolism. They can affect the morphology. Uh, the first clue might be that your cells are growing more slowly. You'll see more dead cells or clumps of cells in your culture. It may be that a few months ago, you had to split those cells two to three times a week, and now you only have to split them maybe once a week. That might be an indicator of a mycoplasma contamination. 
For me, the biggest tell of a mycoplasma contamination is dramatically reduced transfection efficiency. Transfection, most transfection reagents work only if your cells are actively dividing. So if your transfection efficiency is really dropped off, that could be an indicator that your cells are harboring mycoplasmas. Mycoplasmas can damage the cell's DNA, can cause, cause chromosomal uh, aberrations, uh, can provoke uh, innate immune responses, cytopathic responses from your cells, stress responses. So they do have very big effects on your cells, can make your life pretty miserable as well. Another type of cell culture contamination is cross-contamination with other mammalian cell types. So this happens when you're working with multiple cell types at the same time. And I have been guilty of this. I thought it was really great when I worked with multiple cell types that all grew in the same DMEM at the same additives. And I could split them all at the same time and load up the hood and get going and be like a little assembly line. But that's a great way to accidentally cross-contaminate cells. So if you're working with multiple cell types and you drop some cells from one culture into the other culture, and the the first the contaminating cells grow faster they're better adapted to the conditions after a couple of passages you've got a new culture in your original culture so gila are very common cell culture contaminants because they grow so fast and so aggressively there are other examples on the slide here it's very common to have breast cancer cells that are actually ovarian cultures and in some fields years of work have been based on the wrong cell type. Um, so now most all reputable journals require proof of identity of your cells using DNA fingerprinting. That's the only way to know for sure that your cells are what you think they are. The last type of cell culture contamination I'll talk about is contamination with volatile organic compounds. So these are chemicals that we commonly use in molecular biology or organic chemistry applications. You see some examples here, phenylchloroform, beta mercaptoethanol, one of my favorites, ether. Um, and so these chemicals have very strong fumes that can dissolve really easily in liquids. And even if it's in a different room, it can transfer over to the cell culture room and even go into the incubator um, and affect your cultured cells. So another source of VOCs are laboratory cleaners. Uh, chlorine bleach is really bad for the cells. The fumes are bad for the cells. So if you go on a holiday break and your lab kind of shuts down for a week, um, sometimes the custodial staff will clean and wax the floors and those can have effects on cells in the incubator. I've seen this quite a few times. Volatile organic compounds are very dangerous for your cells. They increase stress responses, expression of heat shock proteins, um, cytotoxicity, generalized cytotoxicity. You might see granules in the cytoplasm as an early indicator of cytotoxicity. So where do these contaminants come from? I've talked about the chemicals and this, those sources. For microbial contamination, the most common source of microorganisms is from us. We all carry on average 10,000 microorganisms per square centimeter on our skin. And these microorganisms also are around us in the air. Normal indoor room air contains between 30 and 1,000 microorganisms per cubic meter. So you can see that these microorganisms are ubiquitous in the laboratory environment, and it's really critical to use proper aseptic technique to prevent those contaminants from getting in your culture. So how could this happen? So in the next slides here, I want to kind of tell you a little story about my life and how contamination could happen in my world. So on the x-axis here, we're looking at the time in the course over the course of one year, 52 weeks. On the y-axis, I'm graphing the quality or the percent of what I'm measuring. So on the top here, you see I'm measuring the quality of my aseptic technique. So I think of this as it's the start of the semester and I'm starting a new project in my PI and I have mapped it all out and we've got it all really planned well and I'm excited to get going. I think this is gonna result in a really strong publication. So the quality of my technique is really good. I'm being really careful. I'm really motivated to do a good job. And at the same time, as I said, it's the start of a new semester and we've got a new undergraduate working in the laboratory and his name is Mike. And his primary job is to clean the lab, to keep the incubators clean, to clean the water baths and so on. 
And so Mike is new and he's excited to be in the lab and learn about the science of cell biology. And so he's doing a good job. There's very low amounts of circulating contaminants, dust and dirt floating around in the lab. And so time goes on and my friend Stephanie comes in and she's telling me about something funny that the cute guy down the hall that she's had her eye on told her. And I start laughing and I accidentally touch my pipette tip to the outside of my growth medium bottle. But I catch myself, I discard that pipette tip. I made an error, but I, I corrected it and I moved on. Now, Mike's having midterms, midterm exams, so he's spending less time in the laboratory and we've got kind of a transient buildup of dust and dirt in the lab. And time goes on. My experiments are not going perfectly. I'm having to do some troubleshooting and repeating experiments and I'm feeling kind of crunched for time. So I'm starting to skip steps. I'm not wiping down the hood when I first start my work because Stephanie was in before me and she's really careful. And Mike has figured out that cleaning lab equipment is not so exciting and maybe he's not doing as good of a job. He thought he'd be doing experiments by now. And so time goes on, we, my PI has loaded another project on me. I'm getting just a little bit more careless and Mike is getting a little more careless and pretty soon these two lines cross. There's a lot of dust and dirt built up in the lab and I'm not doing all the things I know I'm supposed to do and I get a contamination. So I have a little talk with myself about how I have to do all the things I know I'm supposed to do anyway. And I have a little talk with Mike about how critical his work is to the success of our research overall. And, you know, if he does a good job there, then eventually, yeah, we'll let him do some experiments next semester. So hopefully this sounds familiar to some of you. And let me now talk about ways to reduce the chances of contamination in your culture. Number one, Play, pay close attention to your technique. Do all of the things that you know you're supposed to do. Use proper aseptic technique. Wash your hands when you first go into the lab. Wear those lab coats and gloves that help reduce the chances of microorganisms getting into your cultures. If somebody texts you when you're working in the hood with your cells, please don't answer that text. If you really feel like you have to, then at least you know put on fresh gloves when you go back into the BSC to work with your cells. Work with only one cell type at a time. Don't share reagents across different technicians or across different cell types. Aliquot your complete medium so that you're using one aliquot for one cell type and a different aliquot for another cell type. And keep notes of all of your cell culture work. Every time you passage your cells, when you look at your cells under the microscope, take an extra minute to look, actually look at the cells. How do they look? If they're adherent cells, do the membranes look nice and tight all the way around the cells? Um, do you see any granules in the cytoplasm that might be an early indicator of stress? And if you do get a contamination, write it down. What were the circumstances of that contamination? What were you doing that maybe caused that? This allows you to isolate problems before they spread to other cultures. Clean the lab, clean the lab, clean the lab. Um, clean and disinfect the whole lab at least once or twice a month. Don't forget the corners. We have we all have boxes of cardboard boxes of plastic ware stored everywhere in the corners, and maybe there's dust and dirt, dust kitties that are hiding behind those boxes. Um, clean the water bath, clean the centrifuge rotor and the centrifuge chamber. Those are things that a lot of people miss. Clean this the telephone, the your cell phone, um, the microscope stage. In the refrigerator, try to not store cardboard boxes in there that can get damp and harbor fungi. Um, when you aliquot your media, make sure you date it so that as it gets older and maybe you're not using that bottle or that tube anymore, you can discard that so that it doesn't get contaminated or worn out after time. Consider contamination control mats. Those are sticky mats that you put on the floor just inside and just outside the cell room, the cell culture room door and this helps to limit uh, microorganisms coming in on your footwear that could spread into the laboratory air and get into the link, the incubator in your cell cultures. When you're working with your cells, work clean to dirty in the BSC so that if you're right-handed, your waste is all over to your right side. Um, that way you're not carrying contaminated medium or waste medium over your cultures as you're, um, you know, transferring fresh growth media to your cells. Please don't use antibiotics in your cell culture unless you have to do a selection. And even then, once you've got the stable cells, 
you know, if it's possible, stop using the antibiotics. The reason I say this is that when you're using pen and strep, those can give you a false sense of security. As I said earlier, they don't work against all microorganisms, and so it may delay any information that you have of getting a cell culture contamination because microorganisms don't travel in pure cultures. So if possible, stop using antibiotics when you're culturing cells. Use only cell lines confirmed by DNA fingerprinting. If you get cells from a collaborator, confirm that they have been identified before you receive them. When you do receive cells from a collaborator, try and use a quarantine incubator or a box so that those cells, you can passage them for a few times and do some mycoplasma tests before you actually put them into rotation in your incubator with your other cells. And do tests for mycoplasma monthly because this can help you identify a problem again before it spreads. The CO2 incubator, my favorite lab equipment, it's the home for your cultured cells. So when, when you're refreshing the water for the humidity in the incubator, change that out to completely fresh sterilized distilled water once a week or at least twice a month. Um, don't just top it off because all you're doing when you top it off is just adding more water for the fungus and bacteria that have already gotten in there. Clean the inside of the incubator at least once per month. Um, use mild dish soap and water and then rinse that down and then use 70% ethanol. At a minimum, use 70% ethanol, spray it down, wipe it down, and allow that to air dry because as we know from COVID, it's that allowing it to air dry that helps to disinfect. Also, 70% um, ethanol is extremely effective against mycoplasma, that, so that's another reason to do that. Uh, remember to clean and disinfect the doors and the door handles. Anything that you touch on the incubator should be disinfected. When you're standing in front of your incubator, look up. Is there a ceiling air duct that's maybe blowing some damp air containing fungus right into your incubator so that every time you open the incubator door that's going in and contaminating the water and representing a risk to your cultures? Don't store anything on top of the incubator or and also uh, use a stand for the incubator because every time you open the incubator door that creates air currents that can blow dust and dirt and microorganisms into the incubator. If you do spill growth medium in the incubator, clean that up right away because as I said earlier, microorganisms love those nutrients. So keeping your incubator clean will help reduce any chances of contamination there. So that's the end of the talk about cell culture contamination. I do just want to mention our thermoscientific cell locker system. This it divides your incubator into individual boxes that can help protect from cross-contamination. We have evidence that microorganisms cannot get in or out of the closed cell locker chamber. It also allows you to isolate projects or viral constructs from other projects. And if you are interested in the, the complete cell locker system as shown here, when you open one of those cell lockers, the other cell lockers do not see that door opening. So that means that if you're working with really sensitive cells like immune cells, neurons, primary cells or stem cells, they're in the era, their ideal environment without disturbance. So that's really cool. All of our incubators include leading technologies that give you ideal cell growth, including Thrive Active Airflow Circulation to ensure fast recovery from any door opening and uniformity top to bottom and side to side in the incubator so that your cells all grow in their ideal conditions, regardless of where you put them. Um, we've got other technologies listed here that are cutting edge. Uh, if, you're, if you're transitioning to a GMP environment, we offer IQ, OQ and temperature mapping services and, and documentation. And also we can do some customizations if you have a unique approach to your cell culture. We've got lots of technical resources at our website at thermofisher.com slash CO2. Thank you so much for sharing. That was another great session. As I mentioned, we'll have it on demand shortly on YouTube on Thermo Fisher's channel. So you can access that and share with uh, your colleagues and your friends. Um, so be sure to join us next Thursday, October 12th. Um, our topic for that week will be tips and best practices for caring for your biological safety cabinet. So um, a nice segue there. So yeah. uh, we hope to see you next week. And uh, again, thank you, Mary Kay. And we hope everyone has a great day.